Real Impact Podcast. My name is Gina Gleason and I'm the leader of the Real Impact Ministry here at Calvary Chapel Chino Hills and always excited to bring you a podcast to talk about interesting things with in- interesting people. And uh, today we want to talk about a very important issue I think that we're all hearing about right now about parental rights and the rights that we have to raise our children according to what we believe and the, the way we just want to see our children uh, educated and the things we want them to be exposed to. And that is being challenged in our public school system today. And so we have an interesting guest. Her name is Erin Friday. And Erin and I just got to recently know one another as we just became more involved in some of these pieces of legislation in California, and she has a very interesting story, a heartbreaking story, but has victory at the end. So I'm really excited to talk with Erin because you all know what the schools are doing right now. Kids are transitioning to the opposite gender. Parents don't know. There's lawsuits, especially in California. And so we want to dive a little bit into that so that way we know our parents are educated and informed, and they know what to look for when their child is in public school and being exposed to these types of issues. So, Erin, welcome. So glad to have you with me today. Thank you so much. Okay, good. Well, thank you. Um, you you've had quite a um, initiative process right into this whole transgender mania that's been going on, not only in California, but across the country. And it's personally affected you, your daughter, your family. And um, it was just a strain and something you didn't expect. Is that correct? Uh, Absolutely. I don't think I would have uh, imagined the journey that we went through um, with my daughter. Yeah, so tell us a little bit about it because um, not everyone has heard your story, but it's a very compelling story. And I just love the victory that we have at the end for you and your family. Yeah, I was very lucky. Uh, So my daughter in seventh grade had her sex ed, uh, comprehensive sex curriculum at her public school. And at the time it was five hours, so an hour a day. And I trusted the teachers because I knew them. I knew them personally. And uh, what I didn't know is that a third party comes in to teach sex ed to our kids. And this group taught a whole hour about gender ideology. They had little cute cartoon characters with um, a female body and then an arrow pointing to the brain saying male brain transgender and vice versa. Um, They used really kind of cutesy ways to um, intrigue kids. And uh, after that class, my daughter, along with four of her friends, all picked a gender that was on the alphabet. Um, and that was my first opening to, my goodness, what are they teaching our kids at school? Yeah, that's, that's, that's shocking to a lot of parents. But if you go back to the legislation that passed way back when and some of the other bills prior, this is a sentence I want to read to you out of one of the bills, AB 329. It says, Instruction, instructional materials shall teach pupils about gender, gender expression, gender identity, and explore the harm of negative gender stereotypes. It's written into the law. Everything that you experienced in that class that your daughter was taught, it's written into California law. So tell me, um, Erin, how did you go about getting into that sex ed class? Uh, Well, actually, I want to jump in about the law, if I could, uh, just for a second. So what the law also requires is, is that what is being taught to our kids is scientifically accurate. True. And so they have a burden to show that gender expression, gender identity is scientific. And I know that there's been a lawsuit filed on that, and I think there really should be more, because there is no science backing up that anybody has a gender identity. Um, They also need to be factually correct, historically correct, with the stories that they're telling. And they are not. I mean, they can't go back into the 1800s and say that a person was transgender because a woman wore pants. That's what they're doing. It's just not a- accurate. So California schools are breaking 
breaking the codes, even though the codes are poorly written to begin with. Yes, um, you can even go to the CDC website and get some real facts there. Not always, but sometimes you do. And they don't align with what we're being taught in the public schools. There's yeah. so many misstatements, so the facts that um, they're just throwing out there to just cover up what they're teaching our children. That's right. Yeah, so tell me about how you got into that um, sex ed class. Well, um, I didn't get into the class. It, it came later when I went to the parent class about the sex ed class because I was so astonished that five girls came home with, I'm a lesbian, I'm a pansexual, I'm polyamorous. Um, the language just didn't make sense for 11-year-old girls. Uh, and so I went to the parent course, and in the parent course, I was even more uh, gobsmacked because in that course, uh, they said that there's either G.I. Joe or Barbie on either end, which is a gender stereotype, is it not? Uh, and nobody's Barbie and nobody's G.I. Joe, and everybody in the middle is on the spectrum, which means everybody's transgender. And the course was, was gobbledygook and nonsense. And, you know, I felt, oh, maybe I'm just really dumb. Um, but no, it all defied logic. And I just kept shooting my hand up and saying, this doesn't make any sense. Why are we doing this? Um, you know, they had a sheet, and I wish I had kept it, with like 36 gender identities. They were nonsensical. And that was the opening to oh my gosh, our kids are getting indoctrinated at school. Um, and then we fast forward a little bit and the indoctrination worked, you know, wonders with my daughter. She went from polyamorous, wait, no, she started at pansexual, then she went to lesbian, um, then she went to polyamorous, which makes no sense because she wasn't sexually active. And um, during the pandemic, she landed on transgender. Uh, which is, this trajectory is pretty normal. These girls bounce to, you know, non-binary to trans, lesbian to trans. Um, but, it all, but, you know, the holy grail is trans. That's where you end, and that's where then it's real, you know, according to the ideologues. So how long was she experimenting with these other ideas about gender before you actually found out? Uh, well, I found out when, during the pandemic, when she was on online school and the school changed her name to a male name and two male pronouns. And she was, you know, in class down the hall from me and I heard them using different names. Uh, so that was, you know, one of the openings, although there was already smattering, like I said, when she came home with a different identity and I you know, I kind of brushed it off. I did think, thought, you know, kids being kids. Um, that was a huge mistake. And how did she explain it to you? Why was she going down these different paths with these different identities? Why, what was she saying about herself and why she was doing it? Well, that's the really interesting part. They really can't express what any of this means. And so when I queried her, what does it mean you're a boy. Her responses were, I don't like my breasts. I don't like my period. And I responded, well, you just told me why you don't like being a girl. Why are you a boy? Mm -hmm. And there was no answer to that. And there usually can't be an answer this, to that because one cannot feel the other sex. I cannot feel like a dog right. because I'm not a dog. I don't know what they feel like. Right. So tell me about the other girls that she was friends with at the time and the parents and the families. How are they looking at this? At this? Were, you guys, were you talking together? Were there you know, discussions amongst the parents? Or what was happening with the community? Not, not really, because the pandemic had started. Um, and so the girls seemed to be much more isolated than the boys. And so we didn't really see parents we didn't really see um, other kids. Um, my daughter did become friends with kids from another school who took on a trans identity, and I spoke to those parents, and I was, again, gobsmacked by their lack of curiosity and their flippant response. Um, 
you know, in one particular case, uh, the child was engaged in, in, in drug use and, uh, you know, rampant pornography. And her mother just was like, oh, what are we going to do? And in fact, I saw that the child, and she's a child, um, she was trying to sell her photographs to a sugar daddy. And um, the mom didn't think anything of it. I, of course, called the police, but I didn't have an action. She did. And, you know, so it, it tells you the caliber of the parent in this case um, was very different and removed from the way I parent. And so as you progressed and you found out more and more about what she was doing and you objected and you approached the school, tell me what happened at that point. Yeah, so I actually thought the school would be a partner because I always partnered with the school. I, I volunteered at my kid's school. I was that person who drove on every class trip, you know, who was yard duty, bugs, whatever it was, weeding class. I did all of that. And um, I thought the school would partner with me as a parent. And instead, when I asked the school why they would change her name uh, and pronoun, they said they needed to have a safe space for my daughter, which is absurd. <laughs> my daughter hadn't stepped foot into the school. They did. I asked them, what color hair does she have? Is she fat? Is she skinny? Is she tall? They knew nothing about her, but they were going to change her internal belief about herself, something so monumental. And they knew nothing about her. They had never laid eyes on her. And by extension, I said, am I unsafe? And the answer, of course, was yes, because CPS showed up at my home, um, and followed by the police. Um, so... You know, I don't remember how I got out of it, but I, but I did. Um, but that was the response. And, and again, that was just um, my naiveness of thinking that this, the school was going to be a partner. Right. So was it the school authorities that actually called CPS on you? Uh, you I CPS, believe so, yes. Child Protection Services. I think they did it under the guise of suicide. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, they, they had said they looked on her computer. Because, you know, they, the schools spy on kids, right? They, yeah. they have access to all their searches on their computer. And um, she had looked up how many monster drinks it takes to kill, you know, a 110-pound person. And so they used that as the, you know, hook to send the police to um, visit me and um, I immediately pulled my daughter from the public school, um, and it's always interesting to me. They never called to check on my daughter after I pulled her. They didn't. They didn't care oh, about her. So they didn't even know if they, she did commit suicide. They don't right? care. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you pull your daughter out of school, and tell me about what you did to bring your daughter back to who she really is. Well, that's a long story, but um, I do want to back up that when a child takes on a gender identity, um, their mental health plummets. They become almost unrecognizable. Their depths of depression become so acute. I've um, heard that, yes. Because, you know, they're, they're being told that their parents don't love them and only strangers love them. And that really spins a child out. Um, so my daughter was severely depressed, not getting out of bed, not brushing her teeth, not taking a shower, not eating. Uh, it was, it was frightening. You know, there were many a nights where to get her to go to sleep, I, I would drive on the highway at two o'clock in the morning oh, and gosh. let her fall asleep in the car. Um, but to pull her out, the most important thing that I had to do was take that darn phone um, cut the internet out because there was a whole cheerleading section of strangers telling her to hate her parents that were bigots, that were homophobes, um, to, you know, enticing her to run away, to emancipate, um, to get on hormones, to find hormones. This whole group who, who again, know nothing of my child, yeah. enticing her. 
Yeah, and, you know, we see that. As a matter of fact, just this past week, we had a school board meeting, and one of the leaders of the LGBT organization from our community announced to the students at the school board meeting that her organization would be their safe place. What are they all saying? All they're saying is that the parents aren't the safe place for that child. And over and over, we hear that from, no matter where you're listening, what event it is, what TV show, where, where these activists are, they say the same thing over and over. Parents are not safe. Parents don't love you. If they did, they'd let you transition. They'd let you do whatever you want to do, all these experimental things. So that's, that's one of my big pet peeves. There's many with this <laughs> issue, but gosh, the way they talk about parents, yes, we know there are bad parents. That's a fact. But there's also... A mandated reporting. A school has to report a parent if the if the child looks like he or she's been beaten. And so, and Gina, it's a, it's the exception absolutely. that the parent is bad. It's the exception. It's the rare occasion. Right. Well, they want to make it seem like they love your child more than you love your child. Yeah. Right. And that's and they it showed is. it by not even calling to check on my child after you know she was quote unquote su- suicidal. I yeah. mean, that's how much they cared. They loved them, her so much more than I did. Yeah, absolutely. So so you, you did things like you took the phone away. And um, what kind of question, when you were talking with your daughter, tell me about some of the things you asked her about, not only how she was feeling, but, you know, what did she want in the future? Did she want to ever be married and have children and did she think about those types of things or was it just at the moment right now this is how I feel this is what I'm going to do whether you like it or not kind of attitude okay so this is this is um this is painful because um because these kids also hear if you don't transition you're going to commit suicide the things that she would say to me is when I'd ask her about her future is I'm going to be dead anyway. Mm-hmm. Transgender people commit suicide. Think about that. What yeah. you're doing to a, you know, 13, 14 year old child, you're telling them that they're going to commit suicide. Mm-hmm. That's the internet people. Yeah. That's the messaging. That's the messaging from school. That's the messaging from teachers. That's the messaging from our government is that they're going to commit suicide. So, for her, there was no hope around the corner. Um, and that also leads to the, to the depression. There's no, speaking to a child too, you can't speak to them logically because their brain has been taken over by an ideology and, and I would say a cult. Um, Absolutely, really, that's, a cult is the perfect word, brainwashing. And it, it's hard. I mean, we've listened to those stories on um, TV about the cults that um, just take over grown adults. And these adults are brainwashed, kill themselves, or, or whatever tragic ending they have. And our kids at that age truly don't understand that. So as she um, came around to understanding um, a little bit more about what you wanted for her, did she see, did she really realize what was really happening in the trans community? Did she ever see the pictures of the girls who have removed, removed their breasts or heard the stories about the boys who have removed their genitor, genitals and what medical impact that has had upon their body? Do they ever talk about that aspect of it? Well, we didn't. I made her listen to it for sure. And I was very um, direct in how I handled this. Once once she got her mental health to a point where she wasn't so extremely depressed, um, I made it very clear to her her on how I felt about this. I left, I had a giant poster of the girl who had cuts all over her stomach and, and arms, like just cutting all the way down her arms. And then she has the two last cuts across her breasts and and that poster sat in my front room Mm. so she could see that they are cutting up mentally unwell people right you know that the surgeon did the last cut on this on this child so i made it very clear about 
what the harm is to the body. And I also, um, you know, I tried everything. I don't know what resonated and I don't, I don't think I'll know until she's in her twenties. Um, but these kids too also think that they're being progressive and like sticking it to the man or, yeah. you know, we're, 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 uh, social justice warriors and, I would kind of back into it and, and talk about the opioid crisis and, and who made all the money on that. Yeah. Guess what? The white man that you're trying to say is the bad man. Mm -hmm. um, same thing with this. I mean, this is big pharma, pharma all over again. They're the ones who are reaping all the benefits. People are investing in their losses of body parts. Right. And kids don't like to be taken advantage of. It's, you know, I, I talked about jewels and the fact that they put candy flavored stuff in jewels to entice you. Like, and you guys fell for it. Like, how stupid. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like, you have to attract. I had to, like, reach down to, like, what would affect a 13 year old, 14 year old. Mm -hmm. um, because telling them about science and saying puberty blockers are dangerous and they can cause bone. Right density and you're not going to have a baby. I don't ever want to have a baby. None of that stuff works. Mm -hmm. um, you kind of have to go to their level. So I, um, I played podcasts about cults. And then after like two or three of them, I said, Hey, some people think transgenderism is a cult. And I walked away. <laughs> yeah. Good tactic. Yeah. And, and the thing about it is that um, it's rampant. It's in the public schools. It's on social media. It's on regular TV. You can't, I don't even watch regular TV anymore. You can't watch a commercial without seeing something that's just so outrageous. And my son doesn't even have a TV in his house. You know, he has five young kids because you just can't trust the TV nowadays because it's, it's everywhere. So, well, thank God you were able to, to pull your daughter out of this. Tell us about her today. How is she doing today? Well, she's a happy 16 year old and she likes her body parts, maybe a little too much right now. <laughs> Can you go somewhere in the middle? Um, but yeah, she's, you know, it stays with her though, um, because you get catapulted into stardom when you're a, a trans kid. Like, you become amongst, special amongst the peers, right? And the teachers, you know, you get love bombed. You're so brave. You're so amazing. Oh. And then you become a regular again. And that's hard. And also the kids who pretended to like you because you're trans didn't really like you. Yeah. And so you, you carry this. So I'm, I'm really hoping that she gets to be her own person and really grab her real identity when she goes off to college because... You know, this stays with these kids, and that's why it's hard for them to switch. Um, you know, they have mud on their face. Like, everyone cheered you as being this special person, and now you're not anymore. It's hard for a teenager. Does she keep in touch with some of the kids that were in her prior circle, the kids at trans or the kids that were in the public school? Do you know? I wouldn't allow it. Okay. Yes, <laughs> no. Not that I know of, unless she's sneaking behind me. No. Right. So let's talk about that. You, you took the phone away from her and um, you, uh, none of the same friends. Um, what else did you do? Switch schools. Uh, spent a lot of time with family uh, and, and family, not just us. Like she needed to go see the aunts and uncles, okay. the grandparents who knew her as a little girl. Mm -hmm. um, we also uh, took her to national parks to, to, you know, learn about what's reality, beauty, mm -hmm. how strong your body is. You can hike to the top of this mountain. Right. Well, how amazing it is to be a woman. Yeah. Well, it sounds like you did all the right things to, to bring her back. And do you have other children? I do. I have a son who's not much older than she is. Um, which and is, how you did know, he react to all of what she was going through? Uh, it was really hard on him because my daughter was horrible to me. Mm. Uh, vicious. Um, really? They become, w when kids are depressed, they become really angry. And it all was shot at me. Horrible, horrible things she said to me. 
um, and my son watched me crumble, mm. and he really disliked her for that. Our whole fa- transgenderism affects the whole entire family. It affects the marriage. So. It affects the siblings. It affects your household. Like dinners became dark. Every there was a cloud, and he mm. he he got short shrift. I mean, I was a really fun mom. We had a really fun household, and that disappeared. Uh, yeah, I can imagine that was just such a burden. And so, your husband did you did you were you the one that did all the research? Did, did your <laughs> husband support you in that? And what was that like? Well, I did all the work. Okay, as <laughs> as mom mom normally does. Um, Mama could, rescue, right? Yeah. Yeah, and and some of it was so dark um, that I don't think my husband could stomach some of it. Mm. And I think it's a cop-out. Uh, but I have to say I am blessed in that I was able to quit my job. And, uh, you know, I, I'm now an advocate, and I spend a lot of money being an advocate, my own money. And that's a gift that he's given me. Wonderful. But I think, um, I really think more of the dads um, need to stand up, even if it's unsavory and uncomfortable. We need them. Absolutely. And I think that's just the way it is overall in any of these things that we're dealing with, because, you know, we're, her and I are on a lot of phone calls together with other leaders, and most of the people on the call are women. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I, I don't know if it's just this, this whole thing about, um, just the intuition of being a mother and knowing what our kids need and being able to read them and understand them maybe a little bit better. Um, but yeah, it's, it's always seems to be, to be the mothers, the women. And, um, so that's just so admirable of, of what you've done. And what it's done is brought you to an organization that you started called Our Duty, which is a parent support group. So tell us about Our Duty. Well, I didn't start Our Duty. Uh, it was started in the UK. I joined them. And again, I was really lucky because um, the founder of Our Duty lets us really do what we want to do and what we need to do here in the United States. He's in the UK. I had joined every parent group I could think of when I first, <laughs> <laughs> when I first uh, said, you know, I've got to, I've got to do something to stop this because it's not good enough to save my child. And again, kind of going back to the female thing, like I feel like I'm a mother to all children, not just my own. And so I can't walk away. I'm compelled. Um, but this group really lets us be advocates. And I didn't want to have a group that was a support group where we we talked about our sorrows um, because there's already a group who does that and they do it very, very well. I'm an action person. I've got to wipe my tears away and figure out what I can do. Because to me, that is, you know, that's my calling, I guess. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm an action person. You can go to a lot of conferences, listen to people talk, talk, and talk. But what's the end result? What are we going to do about it? So tell me, does your group has um, parents who are also dealing with uh, children who are gender confused, right? Mo yes, most, probably 99% of the parents in our group have a gender confused child. Some of them have kids who desist it, like me. Uh, some have detransitioners, those who medicalized and then changed their mind. And a lot of the parents are still in it. Um, and some of them are estranged from their kids, but they don't want this to happen to others. And so they, they stand up. We also realize that it's the detransitioners and the parents that are on the front lines of this battleground. Um, we are the front line, and there's nobody coming in on a white horse to save us. Absolutely. It's us. Yep. It's us. Absolutely. And so how do um, parents find out more about your organization? 
Uh, so they can go to ourduty.group, and there's a contact sheet so people can sign in. And if people just want to help support in any way, reach out. If you want to just be on the email list where we do calls to action, please reach out. Um, if you want to get simple information that you can pass out and educate to other people, we created all these fact sheets. They're one, one or two pages very simple. What's puberty? What 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 are the problems with puberty blockers? Why is transgender not the same as being gay? Tell us about detransitioners. Very simple things. Um, I place them in all the free libraries, you know, around my neighborhood. I put them in free newspapers. I drive around with with them and just drop them off, you know, Starbucks. Who knows? Who you know? Who's going to read them and and maybe peek them? Okay, that's wonderful. I hope parents take a look at your website. But now I want to move on to what you and I have been working on. We had a fantastic bill that was introduced by Assemblymember Bill Asaley, AB 1314. Tell us about that bill and the fight that you and I and others got involved in and what the end result was just this last couple of days. Well, the good news is that a bill was proposed that would return parents to their rightly position as parents and in the know. So this bill was very simple. All it said was that schools are required to let parents know if their child is struggling with gender at school. That's it. Really, really simple. Let simple. parents know. Short text. It was just fantastic. Yeah. Just, I mean, really a nothing bill, but really powerful because parents need to be involved and, and every medical society says that even the ones that i don't like <laughs> say that parents need to be involved right. in the decision to socially or medically transition their their kids schools don't have the ability to understand what's going on with this child whether this child has had trauma depression parents don't have the opportunity like i did to pull their kid from that school I mean, my daughter could be walking around right now with scars on her chest right. uh, had she stayed at that school. Mm -hmm. So it was really simple, and I was really excited that Bill Asaley took it up. He was actually the last door that I knocked on when I was shopping for someone to author the bill, and I burst into tears when he said he would take it. <laughs> Very bold, a freshman. Absolutely. Um, and you know, I have to be honest, didn't think we were going to be able to pass it, but I also didn't think the Democrats wouldn't hold a hearing. They didn't hold a hearing to shut parents down right from the get go, um, with a nonsense basis. Yeah. So for, for people who don't understand the legislative process, when a bill is introduced, like 1314, the first step is to be assigned to a committee, and that committee has to have a hearing. Well, that first committee, the education committee, the um, leader of that uh, committee decided he was not even going to bring the bill in for a hearing. He was not going to give us a chance to make our case on why we believed this was a good bill, and even for them um, to make their case of why they didn't like the bill. But nope, they just shut us out. And so it was a big disappointment because we had a lot of plans, but we're not stopping there. And we're not going to talk in detail about what our plans are right now, but we're not giving up. We are determined to fight for parental rights. And so it's Aaron and others in our, our group who are strategizing together, and we're going to push forward with this. So that's one bill, but kudos to Assemblymember Bill Asaley. He's bec become our hero for all of us who have been, he's been just so bold and courageous. And he's done things that I haven't seen a legislator do forever. He showed up at the Chino Valley Unified School District board meeting last Thursday and presented his bill to our Board of Education. I've never seen that, but Bill did that. And so we're very grateful to him for, for doing that. But let's move on to one more bill that I think is really important. Uh, for parents to know about, and that's AB 655. 
another problem that we have that uh, a bill that's been introduced. So let's talk about that, Erin. Tell tell everyone what you know about that. Well, bill. it's AB six six five. Did I say what did I say? It's yeah, six six five. five. Yes. <laughs> it's oh, okay. Six, six five. Yes. <clears throat> um. So this bill is uh really probably the worst bill that I've read, and I thought SB 107 was going to be the worst. But this bill, what it does is it permits a mental health provider to decide whether a 12 or older child goes to a residential shelter um, without any claim of abuse or harm to the child or harm by the child. So that means a school counselor couldn't decide whether a seventh grader comes home from school that day exactly. without any provocation. Yes. And that bill has passed the assembly at the moment. Mm-hmm. And so it's moving to the Senate judiciary and we need to stop this bill because this is state sanctioned kidnapping. There's no other word for it. Um, I'm already lining up to file a lawsuit against the state should they pass this bill. It's unconstitutional. Completely. Yeah, so this is another bill that we will be fighting along with uh, our duty, and we will have action alerts on it. We have had action alerts on it and social media. And um, I just want to thank James Gallagher, the assembly member up north, that um, he stood up and, and fought. Um, there was a couple of other Joe Joe Patterson um, stood on the assembly uh, assembly floor and um, they spoke up. Um, I wish we would have had more of that with AB thirteen fourteen, but um, these these two legislators got up and spoke in defense of parents, and we need more of our state legislators to do that because we're not seeing that even if they're Republican. We're not seeing it as much as we should. It was interesting that just the other day at the federal level, they passed a parental rights bill in the House and how Nancy Pelosi got up and made a big speech about how this bill is so terrible because the children were going to be outed to their parents. Another one. There you go again. Yeah. So we're going to um, we'll, we'll show that. Um, but, yeah, this is a uh, uh, parental rights just seems to be on the forefront of, of what we're all experiencing as activists who pay attention to what's going on in the culture. So we plan on working together more in the future, and we're not going to let them have their way without putting up a good fight. And, um, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen with California and um, how many rights we lose as parents. Um, I'm a grandparent fighting for my young children any longer, but I'm fighting, like you say, for every child I'll never meet. Um, We care about the future. We care about children. We love children. Our our idea of loving children is different from their side of their side when they say they love children. Um, You know, we we love these children that we don't know um, because they are children and made in the image of God. And so, Erin, any closing thoughts? No, I just, I'm so pleased that I met you. Um, oh, thank you. I'm, I'm, thank very, you. I'm very pleased um, that we're reaching across the aisle. I do always like to say that I have been a Democrat for 37 years, and mm-hmm. I don't recognize my party anymore, um, that this is not the party that I signed up for when I was 18 years old. And, um, and... The Republicans, I am, I am pleased with the Republicans, but they have to not be afraid of this issue. They all should be speaking up. It's not enough to vote no on a bill. Speak. Ask exactly. the questions. Ask the exactly. questions. I called uh, one of the assembly members who sat on the education committee, and they didn't pick up their phone, but I left the message is that it's not enough for you to believe the same things that we believe. We need you to speak. We need you to speak in defense of the parents who are being accused of not being good parents and not being safe um, with with their children. And so we need them to speak. And so we need to lobby our Republican legislators 
just as much as we need to lobby the Democrats. And there's just one, two, three Republicans who are willing to actually speak up. And we need more because people will listen to them if they were going to speak up. So anyway, I just want to thank you so much. It's been a pleasure to um, fight alongside you. We do it for the right reasons because we love children. And I'm just hoping that the Lord gives us the big victory. But anyway, you are an amazing mom. You're an amazing citizen and person. And um, it's a blessing to know you, Erin. Well, thank you. I, I look forward to uh, defeating this with you. Absolutely. Holding your hand, Gina. <laughs> All righty. Take care. Thank you. God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.